Hi, students. Hope you're doing well here. Um, we're starting to wrap things up before too long. Um, this is obviously my final lecture on crime and punishment, and then we will be moving on to Freud and then to um, Ellie Bicell's trilogy, and that'll take us to the end of the semester. There'll be quite a few things we'll be talking about, as you can imagine, um, continuing to talk about, I should say, um, in the next couple of readings, which have to do with the psychology of, of human beings and issues of human nature, et cetera, as those are reflected in Freud's thinking and as those are reflected in Elie Wiesel's telling us about um, his experience in the Holocaust. And then there are a couple other more fictional stories having to do with, with um, Holocaust survivors. Um, and um, obviously I'll be introducing those to you as well. Um, so I'll, I'll touch, try to touch on the highlights here uh, from the last few parts of the, the book. Again, as I pointed out to you previously, the epilogue is also very important. People have different opinions about it. They like or dislike it, find that it is consistent with um, what's written in the book previously. And some people argue that it's not or don't really feel that it's consistent. And um, so that's obviously something too that I've asked you to kind of look out for and, and think about in reading you know, the epilogue. Did Dostoevsky set us up for the kind of ending that we have in the story or does it seem like it sort of came to a close prematurely? Um, there are people that have claimed that Dostoevsky's gambling debts had gotten so bad that he uh, he needed to get to the rest of, of the, the money um, in addition to what was he was advanced for writing the novel and that perhaps that um, he finished it up before he was really ready to finish it up because he needed the money. So that's what we're getting worth thinking about. Um, so we're moving on here to part four. This is where we really meet Svidrigailov and get him to know him a little bit. We know that he was the employer of Dunya. Uh, we know that he is um, has a, a decent amount of money. We find out that a lot of his money actually came from his wife, and that um, he comes across as, as sort of being that extraordinary man that Raskolnikov wants to be. And as soon as they meet, Sergeyev keeps saying to him, "We're not. We're a lot of night. We're kindred spirits. I can tell that we're going to get along and be friends." And Raskolnikov can't imagine how they could be kindred spirits because all he knows about him at that point is that he tried to take advantage of his sister. Um, you know, we later find out that his wife has, has died um, and under questionable circumstances that he has maybe abused people that have worked in his household, uh, had an arrangement with his wife that he could have affairs and these kind of things. So, um, so Raskolnikov is, is pushed back you know, pushes back at first when Svidrigailo talks about there being kindred spirits. But I think we find out later in the story as, as things come to an end that they, uh, the kindred spirits in that Raskolnikov in some ways at least would like to be the kind of person that Svidrigailo is. The per kind of person who, um, who kind of um, does his own thing, whether or not it's legally or ethically appropriate, um, seems to have, um, a belief that he is superior to other people. And the other side of that is he's capable of, of great acts of generosity uh, and of, of um, you know, being helpful to people. And we, we see that in several instances uh, when Svidrik Gailov, um gives his money away to people. And we're re reminded that Raskolnikov has done the same thing. Now he's only giving away little bits of money because he doesn't have a whole lot. So not the kind of 10,000 rubles or 2,000 rubles or whatever that, that uh, Svidrigailov is giving people. It's, it's proportionate to how much money they have. Um, but I think it, um, you know, we start to see why Svidrigailov believes that he's a kind of a kindred spirit to Raskolnikov. Um, he says he would like to give uh, Dunya 10,000 rubles if she will agree not to marry Luzhin. He wants to go and see her. He says that he is no longer infatuated with her. Raskolnikov really doesn't believe him. We find out that indeed he still is infatuated with her. And uh, so Raskolnikov tries to keep Dunya and Svidrigailov from, from having some kind of uh, you know, a meeting. Um, he certainly agrees with um, Svidrigailov that loses losing guy is a bad guy. And um, I think you know that it reinforces his own belief, Raskolnikov's own belief that, that Luzhin is trouble and would not be a good husband for his, his sister when Svidrigailov actually thinks the same thing, even though he is obviously himself a very disreputable person. 
Um, we now have a then have a really important scene uh, taking place between Raskolnikov's mother and sister, um, and eventually, um, you know, we know that um, we've got this relationship seemingly starting between Dunya and Razumikin, Raskolnikov's friend. Uh, we know that his Raskolnikov's brother, uh, mother, and sister are very worried about him. And we come to this really important scene again, another one of these set pieces where there's a, um, a lot of intrigue involved, a lot of embarrassment involved, um, people sort of yelling at each other, you know, et cetera. Yeah, in this particular scene, this is when Luzhin comes to see Raskolnikov's mother and sister um, because he wants to find out um, about this, the fact that supposedly Raskolnikov's mother has told Raskolnikov that Luzhin said he wants to marry somebody who's poor so they'll feel beholden to him. Um, he, he doesn't, he thinks that, that he was slandered, that he really didn't say it when he actually really did. And he claims that at least he was more subtle in the way he saw it, but basically the point is the same, right? And um, he does not want Raskolnikov to be at this meeting that he's going to have with Dunya and her mother. Um, but Dunya wants him to be there. So he actually is there for that scene. And um, there is, um, you know, discussion between them about, um, about the relationship, about Lucian and who he is. Lucian really tries to, again, act very self-important and, um, and nasty and... Um, you know, that, that is, is obviously a scene that is, is sort of very troubling as, as far as we know, Lucian, um, just about every scene that he's in, um, he does or says something that is, that um, I think is supposed to make us really loathe him. Um, and he claims in this meeting that, that he was willing to save Dunya from her bad reputation and that they are uh, not thankful of him for that. Um, and of course, that's not the case. By the time Luzhin and Dunya are kind of set up together by Svidrigailov's wife, the story of Dunya supposedly trying to seduce Svidrigailov um, has been shown to be false. And Svidrigailov's wife has gone around um, the area where they live and told everybody, actually, my husband sure tried to seduce her. It was the other way around. So her reputation um, had been back to its, its, its you know, sparkling self um, by the time Luzhin meets Dunya. So Luzhin is actually not saying something truthful here. But again, he wants Dunya to be beholden to him. And when she's not, and, and um, it seems to not see him as this great man that's coming to save her. This obviously really much angers him. So he's asked to leave. We think we've seen the last of him, but he does crop up again in a couple important scenes. Um, and Raskolnikov has told Razumikin to take care of his family. He's, he's strongly hinted at, at the fact that, um, you know, that he, ha he has to go away, that he's not gonna be able to take care of his family. You know, after Illusion leaves, it seems like they have kind of a plan for the future. They're going to start a, a publisher's, um, a kind of a, a small publishing business, translating um, various works, and that they can make some money doing it. Um, we know that Dunya is going to be getting mo some money from Svidrigailov's wife that she left for Dunya. Even if she doesn't get Svidrigailov's 10,000, she's got another couple thousand rubles coming from that. And it seems like they've got a plan to get their lives going again, but then Raskolnikov says, I have to go. Um, hints that they might never see him again, tells Razumikin to take care of his family. And once again, Raskolnikov's mother in particular is really disturbed by this. It looks like everything is, has turned the corner and is getting better. And then this is really upsetting to her. Raskolnikov goes to Sonia's house, and uh, Sonia's house, excuse me, and um, seems to really taunt her, seems to be really mean to her, and we're supposed to, I think, wonder why that's the case. Um, it seems as though he is, he, he wants to highlight the fact that she is a sinner, um, because we know he is a sinner as well, and, and maybe wants to, to put them on the same level, um, wants them to both accept their suffering and go on with their lives together. Um, 
and brings up the issue of forgiveness. He has Sonia read from the Bible about uh, the story of Lazarus and his being brought back to life. You know, um, and, you know the raising of Lazarus story, as it's often called. So that if that could happen, and you know Lazarus and could have been forgiven, et cetera, that, that Sonia and Raskolnikov had as well. But of course, we know that Sonia um, has at least a fairly good reason for what she did in prostituting herself to try to save her family. Raskolnikov seemingly has no good reason for the murders that he carried out, especially the one against um, against Lizaveta, right? Um, she, Sonia's going to give him a cross, and he's not ready to take the cross yet. He says he's going to tell her he knows who mattered, uh, who um, Lisa Fetter's murderer was. This really is disturbing to Sonia. Um, and he says, he's, if I come back, I'm going to tell you. Um, again, he, he at times seems to think about you know, committing suicide or maybe just leaving and going somewhere else or turning himself in. He's not ready to do this yet. Um, there's a, another great scene between Raskolnikov and Porfiry Petrovich, the Socratic-like detective. Um, we see again that, that you know, Porfiry Petrovich is Raskolnikov's um, equal in terms of how bright he is. Um, Raskolnikov does not like being sort of toyed with um, like in a, as in a cat and mouse game. Um, I think one of the things that really disturbs Raskolnikov is he it, it's his, emo his emotions that are giving him way all the time. And he shakes a lot. Um, and again, wants to suggest it has to do with his illness, but um, I you could think that Porfiry Petrovich can see through that, that there's something else going on here. Um, in particular, we know that he's aware of the, the, the article that, that Raskolnikov published, where he said that um, the crime is always accompanied by illness of some kind, which again, is um, sort of seems to point the finger at him. Um, at himself. Um, we know that there's somebody who's been walking around the streets trying to intimidate Raskolnikov, acting as though he was a uh, somebody who witnessed the crime. That was not the case, but again, something to really uh, disturb Raskolnikov to the point that he's willing to come in and, um, and confess that he's the murderer. Uh, to the surprise of both Porfiry Petrovich and, um, and Raskolnikov, Nikolai, the house painter, bursts into the office and says, uh, and actually um, Porfiry Petrovich tells Raskolnikov to leave. We know that Nikolai tries to confess to the crimes. We know he did not commit them. We see him as the exact opposite of one of these Napoleon characters here, somebody who's really guilt-ridden and confesses to our murders he did actually not commit, but that he probably, you know, he's, he's like every other, everybody else, he's a sinner. He's done some bad things in his life. Um, he actually did pick up the, the earrings and uh, there was one earring that was dropped behind the door and, and get money for it and didn't try to find the, whoever you know, it belonged to. Um, so it seems like he's, he sees this as an opportunity to atone for his, uh, to, to atone for his sins. And um, this is something that, that, um, that Porfiry Petrovich did sort of not see coming, um, but it does give you know, Raskolnikov uh, the belief that he, he can fight for his existence a little longer. I think he keeps thinking that he can actually get back to, um, you know, get his health back and move on with his life and put the murders behind him. We know that obviously he can't do that ultimately, but he keeps thinking that, that that's the case and that he's going to be able to go on with things. Um, then we have a couple important scenes here. Um, one with uh, Lebziatnikov, who Luzhin is staying with. And he and Lebziatnikov is one of these socialists, one of these new thinkers, and um, talks about his beliefs with Luzhin. Um, and you can kind of see that this Lebziatnikov is is really sort of he's idealistic. He's also really sort of naive, not terribly bright. Uh, Luzhin has Sonia come into his room because we, again we know that um, it's in the same building as as the Marmaladov family. And um, he gives her some money and um, as you know, a, a gesture of kindness. And we find out that when he did this, he actually slipped um, a hundred ruble note in her pocket. We know that Lev Zietnikov saw this. And this becomes, as we find out in the next scene, 
a ploy to make Sonia look bad. So the next scene is this this funeral lunch uh, with Katerina Ivanova with um, the you know the money that she has spent that she got from Raskolnikov to have this funeral lunch, and um, all these disreputable characters show up. People who didn't even know her husband because they heard that there's free food, and so you get this sort of um, the, the first part of it at least is a kind of comic relief. Uh, with all these interesting characters, you know, at, at this at this lunch, uh, Raskolnikov shows off late to the lunch. Um, Lucian comes into the room and says that he needs to to talk with with Sonia, and in front of everybody else, um, he says that um, he confronts her and says that you know you stole this money from me. Uh, I want the money back, and she says she didn't steal the money from him. Um, eventually she has turns her pockets inside out and we find out she does have the hundred ruple note. She doesn't how, know how she got it. She's really frightened by this. Raskolnikov is obviously disturbed by it as well. Um, and um, because we know that, that, um, that Luzhin really wants to make Sonia look bad because it'll make Raskolnikov look bad um, because of his association with her. Um, Lizzie Aptikov came in the room with, with Lucian, and, and this, this is where we find out that he saw um, Lucian put the 100 ruple note in Sonia's pocket, right? So um, he calls him on it and says, I saw you slip that in her dress pocket. I didn't know why you did it at the time. I thought you were just trying to be sort of subtle and maybe think that she would find it later and not know where it came from, um, et cetera. So, Illusion really looks bad here. Everybody starts throwing things at him and they make him leave the apartment. Um, and, and this becomes sort of the last we see of, of, of Illusion. And this is where Raskolnikov, this is where Dostoevsky as, as the, the writer from, from his perspective as the writer um, tells us once more um, from his authorial sort of perspective, what a bad person um, Illusion is, how disreputable he is, et cetera. Uh, so there's this big scandalous scene. Um, we see that Katerina Ivanovna is getting sicker and sicker uh, with her consumption, that she probably doesn't have long to live. And all of these really emotional and disturbing scenes, incidences that she's in, um, seem to be really taking their, their toll on her. Um, I, I want to share with you briefly um, a picture here of Dostoevsky's um, apartment, so you can sort of see where he's where he did his writing, um, and the the uh, the clock is actually set at the the day and time of his is his death. But there's his his um, his his place that he did where he did his writing, um, not you know super elegant, but a pretty nice apartment you would say. Um, so this is the this is the, the place where he's coming up with these these ideas. So uh, Raskolnikov goes to Sonia, finally confesses to his crime. She tries to ask why, and he tries to give her explanations for why he committed the crime. And she can't, she, they don't make sense to her. Um, and, um, and he keeps saying, yes, you're right. That's not why I really did it. So he talks about you know, doing it to get money for his mother. Um, he talks about doing it so he could go back to school again. Um, and then he, and, and because this pawnbroker was a, a horrible person. And then he finally gets to actually telling her that he did it just to see if he could do it, to see if he is one, is one of these, again, uh, great people who can um, transgress um, ethics and morality. And, and this, you know, this, from this perspective for Sonny, it's, you know, be a sinner. And it still doesn't sound right to her that somebody would do, you know, something like that. Um, but he tried, he, so he tries to explain to her, we get the sense that she really can't completely understand it. I think just she's such a different person. And I'm sure has always had tried to avoid sinning in her life. And, and her sin was at least for some kind of a higher purpose for her family. Um, she really believes that she will be saved. And Raskolnikov sees that this is why she can actually go on living her life because she believes that, um, you know, because she uh, prostituted herself for the, the, you know, to try to save her family, that uh, God will forgive her. Um, and um, 
Sonia is going to give Raskolnikov one of these crosses. She, uh, she says that she and Lizaveta had exchanged crosses. Um, Raskolnikov is not ready yet to, um, to take on the, the cross, so we find that later he will be. Um, Lizaveta shows up at Sonia's and says, your mother's in really bad shape. She's been thrown out of the apartment with the kids. They're running around in the streets. Um, doing, you know, dancing and singing and trying to make money on the streets as street performers, and she's getting sicker and sicker. Um, so they all run to see her, and um, you know, in really bad shape. Um, we know Svidrigailov is there. We find out that Svidrigailov um, knows Raskolnikov's secret because he was listening at the door, so he knows that, um, you know, what. Raskolnikov has done and will try to use it to blackmail Dunya into being with him. Um, we know that that actually doesn't happen. We also find out that Svidrigailov has said that, that um, after um, Katerina dies from this, you know, all these horrible circumstances, that he will, um, you know, pay for her burial that he has money that he will give for the three children so that they can be put in orphanages and taken care of so they don't really have to worry about their futures, that he has money that he's going to give to Sonia. So again, he comes across as this very magnanimous person, is as um, nasty and ugly as he is. And his, obviously his, his worst trait is he really, he likes young children. And we know he's been abusive to young children. Um, and um, even is considering marrying this girl who's very young. He has you know, dreams about abusing young girls and things. So, um, you know, pretty ugly things that we find about him. But he, he, he admits to that, you know, that that's who he is. And he goes on and lives his life anyway. Um, and again, does some magnanimous things. Um, we know that um, Danya had received a letter from Sidra Gaylov. Uh, to try to get together a meeting with him. And Raskolnikov, again, is trying to keep them apart as much as he can do so. Raskolnikov goes to see Sergei Lov in a tavern um, to try to talk with him again and tell him to stay away from Dunya. And um, after they both leave, Sergei Lov says that um, he first says he's going to marry he, uh, um, this uh, somebody that he met in St. Petersburg, and that he also has plans to to leave St. Petersburg. And Raskolnikov follows him part of the way to make sure he's not going to backtrack and go see Dunya. Um, and um, just at the point when Raskolnikov gives up and says, "Okay, he's going to do what he said," and turns around and leaves, Svidrigailov turns and goes the other way, right? And, and we know ends up going to see Dunya. Um, and so what sort of happens is that um, he, Sidra Gailov again will try to blackmail Dunya and saying, I know, you know what your brother did. And um, I'm essentially says uh, or intimates that he is going to turn him in if she doesn't agree uh, to go away with him. She says that she's not willing to do that. Um, he kind of tricks her into going into a room in the building where he lives and he kind of, he locks the door so they're stuck in there together. So she can't leave, even though she tries to. Um, we find out that he had taken the gun from Svidrigailov and she tries to shoot him and she misses him, barely misses him the first time. The second time the gun jams and, and he, I, he, gets the, he gets the signal here, right? He, 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 start, he really realizes here that, that there's no possibility of her ever you know, being with him. He's not gonna be able to blackmail her. Um, he tries to, you know, embraces her. Um, and and etc. And finally, I think he realizes that it's, you know what he wants to happen is not going to happen. He unlocks the door, and he lets her her free. Um, we find out that that he basically goes off, decides eventually that he can't go on with his life, and he commits suicide, shoots himself. Um, interestingly, in front of this um, statue of Achilles which is poetic in that if you remember the story of Achilles, Achilles uh, um, does all these great things, but he does have an Achilles heel, right? He does have one weakness, um, which is his, 
his heel, right? When his mother drifted him in the river Styx to make him um, um, immortal, she had to hold him by the heel. So um, the heel is his, the only vulnerable part of, of who he is as a person. And we know that Sir Gaylov has you know, positive traits and does nice things for people, but he has his own Achilles heel, um, which is a major one, as I just said, and his um, liking young people. And he kind of even comes out right and says that I like children. Um, and we see this in these, the, these dreams that he has. Um, and one situation with the girl that he's going to marry and then through dreams that are really disturbing. And we, um, and we only sort of find out at the end of the dreams that they actually were dreams. And I think Raskolnikov was really trying to show, you know, that, that um, this, this ugly side to Sergei Gailov. Um, but he's, he has the, again, shows the, the bravery, um, the ability, the courage to take his own life. And um, so he, he kind of leaves the novel very much looking like this kind of person that Raskolnikov um, had wanted to be. We know Raskolnikov has almost committed suicide a couple times and not been able to go through with it. Maybe he didn't have the courage to do it. And Svidrigailov does. Um, so once again, that sort of reinforces the kind of person that he is um, as this, um, this Napoleonic you know, kind of character. Um, Raskolnikov um, sees his mother one more time, asks her to, to pray for him. She's been reading this um, article that he wrote. She's convinced that he is a great person, that he maybe is working for the government, doing work for the government, and that um, that's why he has to do everything in secret and thinks that he's, you know, he's going to be this next great young intellectual in, in Russia. It's clear that she can't maybe completely understand what he wrote or maybe doesn't want to understand what he wrote. Um, and because she can't understand it, thinks it must be you know, brilliant and, and somehow above and beyond her. And um, so it's, it seems like maybe she's coming to terms with, with why he's been acting so oddly and doesn't look you know, really healthy, that he's, he has all these great secrets that he's keeping as this sort of government spy or you know, however she kind of envisions it. Um, and then he says that he needs to, he needs to leave and he, he goes away again and says that she might not see him again. At the very end, she has, says, you'll come back and see me again. And, and at the end, he basically has to say, yeah, I'll, I'll be back because he sees how disturbing it is to her to kind of leave and, and mean to her too, in some sense, to say that he's never going to see her again, even if that might be the case. Raskolnikov goes to Sonia's. Um, and um, both of them sort of agree to take on their suffering. Uh, Raskolnikov accepts this cross from Sonia. Um, again, that's very symbolic. It becomes sort of his cross to bear. He kind of talks about that himself when he puts it around his neck, that this is his, um, you know, that this is sort of his, um, his albatross, as it were. Um, this represents his, his sin and that he has this cross to wear. She tells him to go to the, the crossroads and kneel down in front of everybody in the public and admit that he's a murderer. And again, that's the crossroads of his life. Um, will he take the righteous path and, um, and turn himself in and deal with whatever the consequences are for what he did and then try to go on with his life? Um, so again, we see this idea of crossroads and wearing the cross, you know, et cetera. Um, but he still, he still is really struggling to do this um, and um, goes into the police office and is told about Svidrigailov, you know, having shot himself. Um, and, and we know that, that Nikolai has, you know, had, had turned himself in and then commits suicide. And so it, 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 it seems in, in terms of the fact that, you know, somebody has confessed and now that person has committed suicide. So they can never get him to retract that confession uh, that maybe Raskolnikov thinks one more time, maybe I can go on with my life. And he tries to leave and, and Sonia is there, she's followed him. And she kind of looks at him and says, you know, I think just the look on her face, you've got to go back and you've got to do this. And she's going to force him to do this. Um, she, you know, 
he understands and believes that she's going to go with him with whatever his punishment is. He's not sure why. At some level, he must know that, that she loves him um, and that she will go with him. Um, and in some sense, that that will be her punishment too. We'll be going to Siberia with him and having to live there uh, during the time that, that he's in prison, however long that might be. And he goes back in and very matter of factly says, pretty straight out, you know, I committed the crime. I killed the pawnbroker in Lizaveta. It was me that did it. And um, and then we move to this interesting epilogue, right? Um, so he is sentenced to eight years in Siberia. Sonia goes with him. Um, his mother keeps believing that, um, or trying to believe that he just went away, uh, that he isn't really in prison, though it's suggested that, that she has sort of figured out what's happened, but she just can't admit to it. She ends up dying while he's in prison. Um, we find that that, um, that eight year sentence actually was a light sentence that um, Raskolnikov has, you know, he turned himself in, he suffered a lot for what he did. Um, he never actually went and and tried to get money for the things that he stole. He never used any money that he got from the pawnbroker. And, you know, so there are other kinds of things that, that he's not, he's not your usual, you know, criminal. Um, and Raskolnikov at first is, is kind of an aloof as a prisoner. The other prisoners don't like him. He seems to still have this sense of superiority. He still seems to believe that even though he turned himself in, that the pawnbroker deserved to die, that she's a louse. Uh, that he made everybody else's life better by you know, doing away with her. Um, he does become very sick at one point and, and Sonia comes and you know, takes care of him. The other prisoners really like her. She's really kind to them. She brings them food. Um, so they, they, they don't like Raskolnikov, but they like Sonia a lot. Um, in part too, I think, because she was willing to come to Siberia with him, um, um, and which is not you know, a very pleasant place to be living by this prison. And it seems like it's only after Sonia gets really ill and, and perhaps might even die that Raskolnikov seems to really realize that, that, that you know, he loves her, that she loves him. And, and perhaps he finally gets to this point where he's willing to take seriously the idea that he's a sinner, that he's a murderer. Um, we know he sort of acted throughout the story sort of like an, an atheist. So we think that maybe he had a conversion experience of some kind. Remember that Dostoevsky himself did and, and returned later in his life after um, being a radical for a time and, and getting sort of drawn into uh, kind of nihilistic thinking um, that he had this conversion experience. And I think we're supposed to believe that that's what happened to Raskolnikov. He's at least at the beginning of that. And of course, this is very symbolic too. Is he's been in prison a year. His sentence was eight years, which gives him seven years to um, really fully atone for his sins, uh, for this conversion experience to, to take its complete course. Obviously, the number seven is very important in Christianity. There's so many instances of seven days and seven people and seven sins and all these kinds of things. So this is very biblical of Dostoevsky and the way he chooses this, the way that this is going to run. Um, and um, so we end with Raskolnikov, um, you know, perhaps at the point when he has finally come to terms with what he's done. Finally, perhaps sees himself as a sinner, can no longer legitimate what he did, and 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 maybe is willing to atone for his sins. But it's he's only at the very beginning of this process. It seems like it's going to be the way Des, you know Dostoevsky sets up the story. It's going to take seven years for him to you know to come to terms with what he did, and maybe for his conversion to be complete. At which time he can go on with his life. We know that Dunya and Razumikin have have married. They're going to try and and you know work together. They've got some money now. Um, Razumikin got some money from his uncle. We know Dunya got the money from Sergei Lava's wife, and so I think we're supposed to maybe imagine perhaps that even though Sonia is ill at the end of the story, that um, if she gets better, that the four of them will maybe go on with this publishing business or do something together, you know, restart their lives. And so there is at least this the the semblance of a happy ending here 
even though there is a little mysteriousness with with the fact that um, that Sonia is is ill at the end, but it's not suggested that she's she's critically ill. So I think that's for the reader to interpret. Um, I just wanted to show you a, another couple of quick pictures here. Um, this first one is a picture of the Haymarket in St. Petersburg. I know it might be a little small to see. Um, you see one of the Orthodox churches with the onion domes in the background. Um, but again, these hay markets were a place where, where the peasants would come and barter and exchange things and, and buy maybe fruits and vegetables. And um, this is where Lizaveta worked to try to help uh, in particular new people that were coming from outside of, of St. Petersburg to engage in this bartering process, maybe to get some, some money for some things they were willing to barter. Um, this obviously fits in with the fact that, you know, her sister is a pawnbroker and maybe they're going to give her things that she can, you know, that they can pawn through her to get some money that they might need uh, for lodgings or food or for whatever it might be. Um, and so these were called hay markets. Um, I think I mentioned previously that, that one of the first great hay markets was actually in Chicago and there was a famous fire at that, uh, at that hay market. Um, and they're also tied in um, in various times and places with uh, revolts by working class people, by, by peasants. Um, and uh, this is definitely the case um, in Chicago. And we know that there were also these revolts that would eventually take place in Russia as well. So there's that picture to show you. Um, here is another one that is purported to be in the building where Raskolnikov lived. And one of these garret apartments, so it's in one of the, the roof apartments. Again, they're supposedly very small, have a low ceiling. Um, it seems that Raskolnikov was in one of the, the cheapest of one of these you know, kind of apartments um, because it was you know, very small. And um, in, you know, in, in, in bad shape. Um, very cramped quarters, and that this contributed to Raskolnikov's illness, both his physical illness and the psychological illness that he was suffering from. So that's supposedly um, the building where he lived. And one last picture to show you is supposedly the building where the pawnbroker lived. You know, and this is what I'm saying. What, I'm, what I mean by the building where the pawnbroker lived and where Raskolnikov lived. Um, based on the names that, that Dostoevsky uses to describe the streets and the buildings, these are thought to be the kinds of places that he had in mind in the story, right? Since, the, since um, when he talks about the, the, the lock, when he talks about the bridges, all of these are real places in St. Petersburg, which of course, for the people reading the story, especially people who lived in St. Petersburg, would have made it very real to them because they knew these places, they knew these buildings, they knew the, where these locks were and where the bridges were, where the hay market is, um, and would make it that more um, powerful of a story to them. So this is purportedly again to be where the pawnbroker lived. Um, I know I talked about some of the symbolism of some of the names of the characters, just real quickly. There are a couple that I don't think I mentioned. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned that Raskolnik actually means schismatic. Right, a schismatic is somebody who has sort of a split in, in their psyche. We know that that's the case with Raskolnikov um, and that's sort of split between his desire to do right um, and um, especially through these, maybe these ideas, these socialistic ideas and, and also being a nihilist at the same time and seeing himself as superior to other people that um, inevitably that would lead to this uh, kind of illness that he suffered from. Um, Zamatov supposedly that that name means to notice. He was the police a clerk. Um, Lusion's name means puddle. I'm not sure I mentioned that before. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned that Razum, Razum from the name Razumikin means reason, intelligence. And again, he's a um, in some ways the most um, likable character in the book, probably along with uh, with Donia and um, and Donia and Raskolnikov's mother. Um, that's all I have for um, this uh, final lecture. So um, I hope you find, found that helpful. I'll be back uh, shortly to do a lecture on Freud's civilization and its discontents. Um, 
And I'll be posting this um, today, which is Wednesday. And then we'll be moving on Friday to the next reading. So I will see you next time for the next lecture.